Good to see you again. Yep. Well, the pandemic is raging in some parts of the world and waning in others. Uh, Rajan Menon, who's a CUNY professor and author writing in Tom Dispatch in an article entitled, The Pandemic is Us, But Now Mostly Them. He writes, a return to normalcy seems like for a distant minority of the world's people, those living mainly in the United States, Canada, the UK, the EU, and China, that's not surprising. The concentration of wealth and power globally has enabled rich countries to all but monopolize available vaccine doses. For the citizens of low income and poor countries to have long-term pandemic security, this inequity must end rapidly. But he writes, don't hold your breath. So comment on the current status of the pandemic and these um, dangerous variants that are now popping up, uh, Delta being the most prominent. Well, what you just described is a extremely interesting, ominous pathology, which has in fact been going on since the very beginning of the pandemic. Uh, so let's go back to early 2020. Uh, in Europe, uh, the, uh, in the early part of the year, the uh, major Germany, Austria, other countries, not France, had the uh, pandemic pretty well under control. Uh, they lost it when Europeans decided they wanted their vacations. And uh, that led to a sharp rise in uh, cases again in the fall. But in the spring, they did have it pretty well under control, not all. In Italy, northern Italy, there was a very severe outbreak for a variety of special reasons. Uh, Italy happens to be in the European Union. There are other countries in the European Union, wealthy countries right north of Italy, Austria and Germany, which had the pandemic under control. Did they send any help to Italy? Did they send doctors, equipment to the fellow EU member to try to deal with the crisis. No, they couldn't even go that far. Uh, fortunately for Italy, they could reach across the Atlantic to the one internationalist country in the world, Cuba, and Cuba sent doctors. Uh, China sent some medicines. They were able to take control of the pandemic. That was at the very beginning. What you just described is a generalization of that. The rich countries have essentially monopolized the vaccine uh, more than they can use, in fact, even a reserve for the future. Uh, the United States, Canada, uh, European countries. Meanwhile, in India, uh, Africa, South Asia altogether, Latin America, there's a severe shortage of vaccines. Well, there is an international organization, COVAX, which is supposed to be concerned with uh, dis distributional equity, ensuring that the countries who need it get the vaccines. Uh, most countries are members of that. Trump pulled out of it, of course, uh, but uh, Biden rejoin. They're doing very little to deal with the desperate need for vaccines in much of the world. But this is not only deeply immoral, but it's also suicidal. And they know it. They know that if these countries, the poor countries, are do not quickly get vaccines, 
there will be mutations, like the Delta mutation you mentioned, there'll be the others. Uh, some of these mutations may be uncontrollable, but the, uh, the attitude of working for ourselves, not for not helping anyone else, is so extreme that it even leads to suicidal behavior, like letting uh, mutants develop, which will of course come back and harm us. In addition to that, there's the effort on the part of a number of the rich countries to uh, guarantee uh, the patent, exorbitant patent rights over the product and the process process of manufacture in the products. So of course that uh, guarantees profits and restricts availability. There are efforts to construct what's called a people's vaccine. Just free up all of the information about the products and the process of manufacture. That would of course lead, allow others in India, South Africa, other places to develop their own approaches that would expedite the rapid control of the disease. But there's very limited support for that. It's an indication. I mean, we are facing a world in which we will either cooperate or go extinct. Basically that is putting it strongly, but not too strongly. There must be the problems we face have no borders. That's obviously true of the pandemic, obviously true of global warming. It's also true of nuclear weapons. If there's a nuclear war anywhere, it affects everything. Uh, so we are in a situation where it's, we either move towards the kind of internationalism that Cuba has exhibited, or we all go down together. Now, didn't uh, the Biden administration offer a half a million doses of the vaccine to different countries? Early on, the Biden administration offered uh, vaccines to that had not been approved by the FDA, the Johnson Johnson vaccine, the AstraZeneca, was the AstraZeneca vaccine had not yet been proved by, approved by the FDA. So it was in storage. And of course, if it stays in storage, it's, it's a life, it's shelf life uh, and soon. So Biden did offer these vaccines which couldn't be used in the United States to other countries. The other countries were Canada, which probably has more stored vaccines than any other, and Mexico, where it was offered as a bribe, essentially, to try to get Mexico to agree to the U.S. Uh, illegal uh, efforts to block asylum seekers. So try to get Mexico to cooperate in that by keeping them from our borders. So some were given then. Now, more recently, Biden has offered more vaccines more broadly. Uh, not very clear to whom and where, but uh, it's at least a small step forward. Now, a relatively new term that has come up uh, in Washington, and I'd like you to translate it, please, into plain English, and that is a rules-based international order. In in plain English, it means do what we say or else. We run the rules. If we don't like the rules, we throw them out. But if we want you to observe the rules we establish, you better do it or else you're in trouble. So most of the rules the U.S. doesn't pay any attention to. I think by now the U.S. is perhaps the only country that has rejected a world court uh, decision for, uh, that was in the case of 
Nicaragua, 1986, the World Court ruled that the US should terminate its terrorist activities, what they called unlawful use of force against Nicaragua and pay substantial reparations. Uh, this was dismissed with ridicule in the United States. Uh, New York Times explained that uh, the editors, that we don't have to pay attention to the world court because it's what they called a hostile forum as proven by the fact that they issued a judgment against the United States. So therefore we can ignore it. Uh, issue went to the Security Council, which debated a resolution calling for all states to observe international law. It mentioned anyone, but everyone knew who they meant. US vetoed it. Uh, all of this has disappeared into non-existent history, wrong story. Uh, the most laws, the international conventions, the US just doesn't ratify. And what about the uh, International Criminal Court? I mean, the US did sign it, but th then did not ratify it. Correct, it was never ratified. So the US is technically not a member. However, the US has acted severely to, to block the ICC from doing things that Washington doesn't like even imposed sanctions. In fact, as you may recall, uh, the Bush administration, under the Bush administration, legit legislation was passed, which in Europe is called the uh, Netherlands Invasion Act. It's an act which grants the US executive, the president, the right to use military force to rescue any American who's brought to the Hague for trial by any international tribunal. The U.S. is alone in this. Uh, the U.S. has avoided some other international, uh, avoided other international jurisdiction in other interesting ways. So Yugoslavia brought a case to the world court uh, charging NATO with abuses in its bombing of, uh, uh, bombing of uh, Yugoslavia. While the other NATO powers accepted the jurisdiction, of course the case was thrown out later, but they accepted it, not the United States. The United States excused itself and the world court accepted the excuse the excuse was that the Yugoslav uh, uh, appeal case had mentioned genocide. And the United States is self-exempted from the genocide convention. There was a genocide convention. The US didn't pay attention to it for I think about 40 years. But then finally, the US did sign it however, with a reservation excluding the United States. So therefore the United States formally claims that it has the right to commit genocide. And on those grounds, it was exempted from the world court hearings uh, on the Yugoslav uh, case for, uh, on the bombing of Serbia. Well, Basically, to go back to the short answer to your question, a rules-based order means we do what we like and you do what we like. Simply, that's what it is. What did you think of the uh, Biden administration's acknowledgement uh, after many, many years of the Armenian genocide? There was a lot of pressure to do that. It's been hanging in Congress for a long time. I don't know exactly what led to it now, but yes, they finally did uh, uh, recognize Armenian genocide back during the First World War. That's um, not 
very hard for the United States to do because it's somebody else's crime. There's no recognition of uh, the extermination of Native Americans, for example. Well, given the level of, of rhetoric, sanctions, military maneuvers from Washington towards Beijing, are we heading into a new Cold War? Or maybe I should change the tense and say, we are in a new Cold War. Well, so far it's a one-sided new Cold War. Uh, the Trump administration had been fairly aggressive towards China. The Biden administration has escalated that. It's now a real, it's bipartisan. The Republicans love it. The military industry is practically salivating with joy over the new militant steps, which offer them a great deal. Democrats are supporting it. It's a bipartisan campaign, which is not only idiotic, but is extremely hazardous. Uh, you look at the timeline of actions that's been taken, it's shocking. Just building up a yellow peril hysteria, which of course goes way back in American history, back to the 1880s, when Chinese were barred from entry to the United States, uh, picked up again in the 1950s with uh, uh, lunacy about uh, Chinese, uh, hysteria about Chinese threats to conquer and destroy the United States. Uh, this has been so extreme that it's even reached what are called progressive circles, like uh, early in the 20th century, Jack London, a progressive writer, uh, wrote a story saying about how the United States should carry out bacteriological warfare to wipe out the Chinese uh, to prevent them from attacking us. Uh, now it's being revived. And it's, I mean, the extent to which it's being revived is, I mean, if it wasn't so serious, you could call it comical. So like when Schumer wants to push through a, what's called an infrastructure bill, something the United States desperately needs, this co collapsing infrastructure that includes other measures like improving our collapsing educational system, uh, providing some limited form of child care as they have in just about every other developed country. In order to do these things which are essential for the United States, it had to be put in the framework of an anti-China uh, bill. So there's a bill saying we have to make sure that China doesn't get ahead of us in uh, artificial intelligence or uh, uh, semiconductors or something else. And in order to make sure that China doesn't get ahead of us, let's do what's essential for our needs. Can't get it through otherwise. Of course, if it had been done without the hate China part, uh, Republicans would have been 100% opposed. As long as it's in the framework of more militarism, more violence, more threats of war, uh, hate China, racism, then the Republicans are willing to come on board enthusiastically. And the Democrats too, that's Schumer and the rest of them. It's madness. I mean, if you look what's actually happening on the ground, it's unbelievable. I mean, Chinese bombers are, have actually penetrated Taiwanese uh, the defense, air defense area. Meanwhile, Biden sends a huge naval armada with two major aircraft carriers into the South China Sea. Highly provocative measures. Well, it all could explode at any time. And uh, notice it's not in the Caribbean, it's in the South China Sea. 
actually China's doing things in the South China Sea that it shouldn't be doing. It is violating uh, international law. But the United States is hardly in a strong position to complain about that, since the United States doesn't, is the one country that has not even accepted the relevant international law, the law of the sea. So what kind of standing do we have to criticize China in its own regional area? The South China Sea is, of course, of extraordinary uh, strategic and commercial significance for China. It's their one avenue to the rest of the world. China, of course, is uh, contained, as we put it, by uh, American uh, nuclear bases and allies. There's a ring surrounding China from the east, uh, the Guam, other Pacific islands, Okinawa, uh, Korea, US nuclear forces. Take a look at a map. Essentially blocks off China from the Pacific. Uh, their one more or less free avenue is through the South China Sea, which has to go through the narrow Straits of Malacca, controlled by US allies. Uh, all of this is, this doesn't justify Chinese actions in the South China Sea, but it goes a long way towards explaining them. Uh, and uh, the United States is now strengthening what's called the Quad, an anti-Chinese alliance, uh, India, Australia, Japan and the United States, Japan, a very right-wing government, Australia, far right government, India under an extremist right-wing government, joining with the United States, the Quad, to uh, defend freedom of the seas and defend the rule of law. I mean, it's, if it wasn't so ominous, you'd burst out laughing, uh, but uh, it is very ominous. And uh, we have to prevent Chinese development. We have to prevent their commercial expansion. Uh, we have to do everything to ensure that there's no possible challenge to US global dominance. Uh, we're concerned about the Chinese military. I mean, their military expenditures are a tiny fraction of ours. Uh, we spend about 40%, I think, the latest figures of global armaments expenditures, Chinese about maybe 15%. And of course, they're in a far more vulnerable position than we are. They're surrounded by enemies. Uh, per capita, of course, their spending is far less. But we have to be concerned that they might overwhelm us. Uh, it's a uh, sanction after sanction. Uh, every, even the pursuing the uh, politicization of the COVID origins issue, which is framed as an anti-China campaign, not as a campaign to try to figure out what happened because maybe we can all working together uh, uh, help ourselves. It's, I mean, the whole, the madness that is developing in the United States is over this is shocking, unfortunately familiar, it goes back to the 1880s, continually that, revived. Quad stands for Quadrilateral Security uh, Dialogue. I didn't know that about uh, Jack London. I had always considered him a progressive writer. Did you not hear me? I didn't hear that. Yeah, I didn't know that about Jack London. I had always considered him a progressive writer. He is. I mean, I don't know if he meant that, how he meant that story. I mean, it reads pretty badly. Maybe he meant, I don't know what, maybe it was satire, but I'm not sure. And given the uh, anti-China hysteria that's being whipped up in the United States, there have been 
literally attacks on Asians and Asian Americans in the streets of the United States. It's having that kind of uh, feedback, unfortunately, to a lot of anti-Asian uh, racism, which is by no means new, as many causes, uh, but it's, uh, it's now showing up more severely with threats to Asians and sometimes implemented threats. Well, talk about, uh, you know, some of China's internal uh, issues, its oppression of the Uyghur Muslim minority in Western China, uh, Tibet, Hong Kong, uh, reports of worker unrest. Uh, at the same time, there's a class of billionaires that's exploded in China as in the United States. Well, Chinese capitalism is probably even more unequal than American, certainly comparable, very unequal society. Uh, there are uh, abuses that should be condemned. I, I don't think anything new has happened in Tibet. It's an old problem. In Hong Kong, China has become more repressive, imposing restrictions on Hong Kong's democracy, which we should recall is a recent democracy. Granted, it was a British colony stolen from China by violence during the period when Britain was leading the global war against China. Chinese don't forget this, we might forget it. But in the 19th century, we might recall that the major uh, part of the, a large part of the basis for the wealth of Britain and its offshoots was narco-trafficking, major, a major uh, enterprise. Uh, Britain conquered much of India in order to try to gain a monopoly of the opium trade, uh, which it could then use to force opium into China at gunpoint. Uh, China had been the richest and most advanced country in the world, but Europe was far superior in the means of savagery and violence. That's how Europe conquered the world. Uh, and Britain was the British. When uh, the Chinese uh, administrator in Canton province uh, approached Queen Victoria to ask her to enforce the law and prevent British narco traffickers from violating the privileges granted to them in Canton. So just enforce the law. Remember this notion of rule of law. Queen Victoria responded by sending the British fleet to destroy a Chinese fleet and its defenses and force more opium into China. The British then invaded, even conquered Beijing, destroyed the Summer Palace, uh, all of this for narco-trafficking, okay? Part of it was stealing Hong Kong, turning it into a base for the British narco-trafficking empire. Actually, the Americans were involved in this too. A great deal of the, you look at the wealthy families in the United States, the concentration of wealth, many of them go back to participation in the narco-trafficking racket of the 19th century. Actually, I think opium for a time was the major commodity in world trade. Uh, the most famous of the wealthy Americans was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. His grandfather, Warren Delano, made a killing in the China trade by narco-trafficking and left a huge legacy to the Delano family, including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who believed that he had special insight into China because of the stories his mother, Sarah Delano, 
was telling him about the exploits of uh, his grandfather that led to very severe consequences, I should say, uh, Roosevelt's unwillingness to understand what was happening in China under his years in office because of his alleged personal expertise. Uh, but all of this is a large part of the background about Hong Kong. It doesn't excuse what China is now doing, but again, it's worth understanding the background. Uh, with regard to the uh, Xinjiang province, the Uyghur, uh, there are credi very credible reports of severe human rights abuses. You read Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, a couple of others, they do include critical, credible reports about the, apparently about a million people were sent through re-education camps and some were uh, treated uh, extremely harshly. Uh, that should be condemned along with many other things. So for example, take the uh, 2 million people, half children imprisoned in Gaza with US aid. Uh, they are subject to far harsher treatment than anything that's incredibly been reported about the Uyghur. And while we can't do much about the Uyghur abuses except to condemn them, we can do a great deal about the evidently far worse abuses that we are helping to implement in Gaza. But we don't talk about that. That doesn't invoke my late friend Ed Herman's terminology. Uh, there are what he called worthy and unworthy victims. The worthy victims are those, uh, the victims of some official enemy, which we can't do much about. The unworthy victims are the ones we can do a great deal about because we're responsible for the abuses. So we focus on the worthy victims, ignore the unworthy ones. Uh, you read the New York Times report on the latest Israeli atrocities in Gaza, Philip Kingsley uh, starts with saying uh, Hamas rockets wrecked uh, Israeli apartments and there was damage in Gaza. Not exactly what happened, okay? But that's the way you deal with unworthy victims. Uh, I'll talk to you more about uh, Israel-Palestine in, in a few minutes. Let's just stay on China for a bit. It's on China is on track to become the world's largest economy in a, in a very few years. What are the implications of that? China is the world's largest economy. If you use purchasing power parity, it's one of the measures doesn't mean anything. In the 18th century, China was the world's largest economy. Did that protect them from European and American savagery? I mean, it's a measure. Uh, first of all, if you look at the, the correct measure is per capita, of course. If you have a bigger population, you have a larger economy. Okay. Uh, China has, uh, what is it, five times the population of the United States. So in per capita terms, it's way below. Uh, if you look at the Human Development Index of the uh, United Nations, which is a measure attempting to include various factors in human development. The uh, last time I looked, China was, I think, about 90th. It's, uh, relatively poor country, which has major internal problems, has enormous ecological problems, has demographic problems, has a deeply author brutally authoritarian state, which imposes harsh conditions on its development and life. It has made unprecedented gains in economic development, uh, 
in recent years and many achievements before that. So it's often forgotten that, or maybe overlooked that uh, during the Maoist years, late 1949 to 1979, roughly, China saved a hundred million lives as compared with India during the same years, comparable cases of societies trying to develop. Uh, India killed a hundred million people as compared with China, uh, just because it didn't implement the rural development programs, health, education, support for development that were undertaken in the Maoist years. A hundred million people is not a small number. Uh, that incidentally includes the deaths from the Chinese famine. Even with that, it's a hundred million saved. And that laid part of the basis for Chinese later development. So it's a very mixed story. China has enormous problems. It's way behind the West in development. It has problems unknown in the Western societies. The idea that we should be trying to impede Chinese development because it might someday compete with us is, I just can't find words for it. I mean, we should be cooperating with them for the common good. We should be condemning their crimes. They should be condemning our crimes. We should be condemning our crimes and doing something about them, okay? Not just condemning them. Now you're saying the Indian 100 million deaths, that was due to poverty. To poverty? Yeah, in India, the 100 million deaths was due to poverty. It was due to the failure to undertake the rural reforms that were undertaken under Mao. Health programs, education programs, uh, uh, help for rural development under uh, Indian state capitalism, but this wasn't done. These, uh, there's a very interesting story about this. Uh, these. Uh, this traces back to work by Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate, highly regarded economist and specialist on India. He had an article in the Journal of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Tittle's major journal, in which he discussed uh, the Chinese famine and uh, the comparison of India to China. Half of the article has been read, the article on the Chinese famine, okay, which of course he condemned. But the other half of the article disappeared. Uh, Sen later did a more extensive study with Jean Drez, a uh, well-known Indian economist, uh, came out in a book I've never seen, in which they went through the details on this. I've never seen a mention of it, except for what I've written. I've written about it a couple of times. I just can't break through. 100 million is an interesting number. 100 million is, there was, as you may recall, a publication called The Black Book of Communism, a book widely publicized, reviews, all rave reviews all over the place with rather dubious, uh, empirical evidence. It uh, claimed that the communist powers, mostly China, were responsible for 100 million deaths. So 100 million is quite a famous number. Uh, as I say, this book, the base, the empirical basis is pretty weak, but for the sake of argument, let's say it's true. Okay. What about the fact that they saved 100 million people as compared with India? Unmentionable. Actually, it's backed by US government statistics on 
demographic growth and so on. This continued until 1979. Uh, after that, it, the demographic improvements declined, the death tolls, mortality increased and so on as it moved into the state capitalist mode. It's kind of also worth remembering that in the 1940s, China, Mao, tried very hard to approach American emissaries to get them to agree to a, an arrangement with between China, an accord between China and the United States which is very much what like developed, what like what like what developed in the last period, China providing uh, huge manpower, uh, while the United States would be providing capital. That was Mao's proposal in the late forties, totally dismissed, totally dismissed in the, throughout the forties. In fact, uh, the United States insisted on supporting the quasi-fascist Chiang regime uh, and not supporting, which, want, which didn't want to fight the Japanese. China, money was poured into Chiang's pocket, enriched himself and the Song family, uh, but it wasn't being used to fight the Japanese invaders. It was Mao's peasant armies off in the Northwest corner that were fighting the Japanese invaders. They wanted to cooperate with Chang. He wouldn't do it. He wanted to save the huge resources, the military resources being poured in for a war against Mao after the Japanese were driven out by the Americans. Uh, that's what it's very similar to what happened in Vietnam when Ho Chi Minh during the same years was pleading for U.S. support and cooperation, uh, U.S. by 1950, the U.S. wouldn't hear it after China liberated itself. These are very important stories which should be well known. They're known to the Chinese, of course. They should be known to us. Again, doesn't excuse Chinese crimes, which are serious, but it helps explain them. We should be interested in explain understanding the background from which these things are developing. Talk about uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative. The Council on Foreign Relations, an establishment organization, uh, says of the Belt and Road Initiative, China's colossal infrastructure investments may usher in a new era of trade and growth for economies in Asia and beyond. Then CFR adds, but skeptics worry that China is laying a debt trap for borrowing governments. What do you know about the Belt and Road Initiative? The Belt and Road Initiative grew out of earlier initiatives by what's called the Shanghai Cooperation Council which was established some years ago at Chinese Initiative, includes uh, uh, the Central Asian states, Kazakhstan, others, includes Russia. Uh, India, I think, is in, has observer status, as does Iran. Maybe it's moved beyond that. Uh, they, excluded the United States asked for observer status, but that was rejected. So it's a Shanghai, a China-based development initiative for Central, through Central Asia, including Pakistan, uh, reaching uh, in principle as far as Turkey, uh, thereby entering the European market. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is an expansion of this uh, lots of infrastructure development. Uh, you can take a high-speed train from Beijing to Kazakhstan, but you can't take it from New York to Washington. The United States is way backward to third world country in development. Fortunately, in the 
framework of hating China, maybe we can develop something. Uh, this, of course, links together. There's a lot of development in Pakistan and development of a major port, which would give China access to the, uh, basically to the, uh, to Europe, to Africa and Europe, in South Asia, in Africa and Europe. Uh, the so-called debt trap has been closely analyzed. There's a long article in the main establishment journal, Foreign Affairs, a couple of months ago, I've forgotten the title, which looks into it and uh, pretty much discounts it, says there's no indication of a debt trap. I mean, China's loans are often, they have punitive elements like everybody's loans, but they don't seem to be out of the normal range in that respect. Uh, they're not like uh, IMF loans, which have conditionalities that you have to impose destructive structure adjustment pro uh, programs. They're free of those conditionalities. Uh, but I'm sure there's negative aspects to them if you look at them, but it doesn't look the least out of the ordinary. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative will succeed to integrate Central Asia, uh, ultimately extending to Europe and Africa, uh, integrated within a Chinese dominated system. The US is trying very hard to stop this all over the place, uh, even in Israel. So for example, in Israel, there's now a project they put out a tender for the development of a light rail system. Uh, and a couple of Chinese form firms uh, applied, applied for it. Very likely they would have gotten the, uh, the uh, offer. They were better offers, but the United States is intervening hard to try to prevent uh, Israel from allowing China to carry out development projects in Israel. China already uh, administers the Haifa port, which China does, is US doesn't like at all. It's a major US naval base. Uh, but in, that's just an example, but all over the world, the same is happening. Uh, you saw what happened in uh, one of the last acts of the Trump administration was to pressure Panama to expel Cuban doctors, because we don't want the malign influence of Cuba to help out a Panama in the midst of a COVID crisis. Same kind of pressures to keep countries from using the Chinese vaccines. Brazil, which is very short of vaccines because of Bolsonaro's criminality, which is severe, it's turned Brazil into a major crisis. Uh, the United States has been pressuring all along not to use Chinese vaccines, which are in fact manufactured in Brazil, uh, not to use Russian vaccines, which are, according to Western sources, about the same as uh, Western vaccines. The last act of the Trump administration, you can read it in the Department of Homeland Security, uh, publication was to praise themselves on preventing uh, Brazil from using Russian vaccines to deal with its enormous tragic crisis and to prevent Panama from using Cuban doctors from the one internationalist country in the world uh, to deal with COVID crisis. It's on a it's kind of similar to the efforts to keep China from developing. We have to make sure that the US rules the world. That's back to your first comment about rule of law. That's the rule. The US rules the world. Any move to modify that, no matter how benign, is unacceptable. It's not anything the US invented. Britain was the same during its 
period of global hegemony. France is the same in the regions it dominates. Russia is the same in the regions, much smaller regions it dominates. Now, talk about uh, U.S. relations with uh, Russia and how they've evolved it, from a very bizarre connection during the reign of the 45th president to the current president, Joe Biden. It was just a amusing column by conservative columnist in the New York Times, Ross Duhat, asking what happened to liberal Russophobia? How come liberals are backing off from Russophobia? Well, uh, I think that was the title, something like that. Actually, there's uh, maybe I have it. I remembered it incorrectly. But uh, uh, the fact is that Trump had carried out quite provocative actions with regard to China, just as Obama had. And it seems to be increasing under the Biden administration. Uh, quite generally, Biden, Biden's foreign policy team uh, has been more uh, more uh, aggressive than uh, even than Trump was. And part of it is uh, actions to increase provocations with regard to China, with regard to Russia, which is not a, totally true. Uh, Biden did succeed. He came into office just in time to uh, salvage the uh, New START Treaty, which was going to expire in February. Trump had refused Russian offers to, re to extend it, and Biden accepted them. That was a good step. But uh, apart from that, it's been mostly increasing tensions. Now, there are plenty of areas of serious contention, plenty. But uh, what's needed is diplomacy, negotiations, uh, working out problems peacefully, not increasing provocation, which is not only wrong, but basically suicidal. If something moves on to a real uh, conf conflict, we're in serious trouble, all of us. In fact, we're finished. One of the things that's kind of a new uh, aspect of international uh, relations, if you will, is so-called cyber warfare. Uh, Iran gets attacked, and Iran counterattacks, Russia attacks, the US counterattacks, uh, attack. This could have potential, uh, very serious potential coming, attacking power grids and water, all could lead to further conflict. What's going on in this area of cyber warfare? There's one, according to the Pentagon, cyber war is comparable to military attack and it justifies military response. There is so far one very successful example of effective cyber war, namely, uh, the uh, U.S. under Obama, the U.S. attack on Iran's uh, nuclear uh, development system, destruction of uh, uh, the uh, equipment involved in uh, uh, nuclear power production. The U.S. managed to destroy it with a major cyber war attack. And of course, took pride in that. It wasn't secret. It was regarded with as a great achievement. Uh, today, that's the major cyber war achievement. As I say, according to Pentagon standards, uh, Iran would have been entitled to uh, launch a military, military attack in response. Of course, that's out of the question. So it's kind of like the worthy unworthy victim story. When we do it, 
no matter how destructive it is, it's praiseworthy. Uh, we don't hide it, we take praise in it. But it is a danger. Others might use it the way we do. Uh, and uh, uh, th there is now a cyber war command in the Pentagon, which is working on ways of uh, blocking cyber war attacks. I'm sure other countries are doing the same thing. Uh, it's an area, another area where treaty agreements would be very much in order to protect everyone. It's not impossible to reach treaties which would protect everyone. Now, you can't prevent rogue elements, but you can at least control states, and that would make a big difference. But that's not on the agenda, apparently, only escalating the conflict. Eisenhower, no dove, in a 1953 speech talked about the cloud of threatening war. It is humanity hanging from a cross of iron. You've mentioned the Damocles sword that hangs over humanity and the planet. And you've been almost a lone voice in warning of the eco disasters looming and the possibility of accidental or intentional uh, nuclear holocaust. So let's start with the latter, the state of the various arms agreements. Um, Biden has, I believe, um, not rejoined the Open Skies Treaty. Is that correct? That's correct. The Open Skies Treaty was, in fact, initiated by uh, during the Eisenhower uh, period than enacted later. It's a very important treaty. It uh, reduces tensions by permitting surveillance of uh, the Russia and the United States. Russia of each can carry out surveillance of the other and recognize what's happening and uh, undercut false alarms. And there have been many false alarms. So it's an important treaty. It doesn't have quite the status that it did 60 years ago because of advances in satellites and so on. But nevertheless, it's an important treaty. Trump revoked it just as he revoked every treaty he could. His main policy was to wreck anything that was around. Uh, and Biden has not rejoined it, nor has he made any move to reconstitute the INF Treaty, the Reagan-Gorbachev Treaty in 1987, which did significantly reduce the threat of a conflict in Europe that could have easily spent, broken out, uh, has done nothing on that. He's also done nothing on the Iran Treaty, contrary to what's constantly claimed. Uh, Biden simply took over the Trump policy. Trump, of course, withdrew from the Iran agreement, it's not a treaty, the Iran nuclear agreement, uh, the JCPOA joint agreement. Trump withdrew from it over the very strong objections of all other participants, all of Europe. Uh, Biden has made some rhetorical changes but in practice, he's accepted the whole Trump program. Uh, no, the, the sanctions remain. It's Iran that is sanctioned after the United States withdrew from the agreement, not the United States that sanctioned. Uh, the sanctions are over the objection of the Europeans. They don't agree with them, but they have to accept them. They have to adhere to them under US threat. U.S. sanctions are third-party sanctions, meaning any country that doesn't accept them can get thrown out of the international financial system, which is basically based in New York. Uh, so Europe unwillingly accepts the sanctions. Uh, Biden has continued to say that he will not accept a return to the JCPOA, 
It has to be a different treaty, a different agreement, which has harsher conditions on Iran. Now, it's very interesting what's happening now. The New York Times had an interesting editorial a couple of days ago. Very interesting. They called for a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. Actually, that's been the right idea for decades. Uh, as you know, we've talked about it. I've been out talking about it constantly. There should be a nuclear weapons free zone in the Middle East. That would end any possible threat, whatever, whether you believe the threats or not, you would believe any threat real or imagined about Iranian nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons free zone with inspection. So it's interesting that the New York Times editor suggested it with a proviso that it exclude Israel, that it exclude the one nuclear state in the region, which of course kills it. The a proper nuclear weapons free zone would include the states of the region, including the one state that has a massive nuclear weapons capacity. But the Times editors carefully excised that part. And in fact, that's the reason why the United States alone has been vetoing a nuclear weapons free zone for years, which the Times editors refused, failed to mention. So Obama vetoed it uh, because it would include Israel. And uh, the, the Arab states are in favor of it. Iran's in favor of it. Global South's in favor of it strongly. Uh, Europe's in favor of it. US vetoes. In fact, as we've discussed before, and it's crucial, so I'll repeat, the US does not recognize that Israel has nuclear weapons. The reason for that is, if it does recognize it, questions immediately arise about US law, which uh, bans aid countries that are developing nuclear weapons outside the framework of the international agreements. Neither political party in the United States has wanted to open that door. And activists haven't pursued it, but they should. So here's an opening. New York Times calls for a nuclear weapons free zone, excluding the one nuclear weapon state in the region. Fine, let's work for extending it. Ends any imagined Iranian threat. Ends any need for the sanctions. Uh, move on towards a more peaceful world without serious threat of conflict, escalating conflict. Perfect solution. Except you have to support illegal US aid to Israel. A spokesperson for the Nobel Prize winning international campaign to abolish uh, nuclear weapons says, Despite Biden's campaign promises of wanting to work for arms control, wanting to work for disarmament, we're seeing that in reality, he's going full steam ahead with Trump's legacy nuclear weapons programs and continuing to spend more money on these weapons of mass destruction. Why in a time of a pandemic, where resources are scarce and people are dying in large numbers, is the United States modernizing its nuclear weapons arsenal? Two reasons. One is called money. The money is not thrown into the ocean. Money for nuclear weapons development goes into the pockets of the arms manufacturers. And that's not just military industry. It's a large swath of American industry is involved in one way or another in arms production, indirectly in many ways. Now, furthermore, uh, Congress wants it for lots of crazy reasons. So the Pentagon has been careful to scatter uh, 
say, Minuteman uh, emplacements in many states in, uh, in, in rural areas. It's the commercial center for a rural area in some um, Idaho and so on. And the Congress says we want it. We don't care if it harms the, it, notice that this is a part of the armed system, which in fact harms the United States. The Minuteman, every strategic analyst knows that it has no utility as a deterrent. On the other, what it does is attract attack. These are fixed emplacements. Russia knows where they are. China knows where they are. If there's any threat of war, the first thing they'll do is attack them to take them out of commission, even when there's a threat or an accidental threat. So it's basic, and they serve no purpose. They add nothing to the military capacity. But even at the, at the point of direct harm to ourselves, it's necessary to increase uh, armaments. Actually, the same is true of the expanded nu uh, nuclear weapon system that simply joins with others to escalate, to lead to greater threats, greater tensions, uh, maybe hypersonic missiles, uh, uh, weaponizing outer space, all increasing the threat to us for two purposes. One, the money goes to centers of private capital. Two, it enhances the appearance of US domination of the world. We can always, as every president says, we can outspend them. Yeah, we can waste more money than they can waste because we have a richer economy. So instead of using resources to deal with our scandalous health system, our collapsing infrastructure, our declining educational system, uh, minimal social welfare that other countries have. Instead of that, let's uh, develop uh, an outer space command so we have better ways of killing ourselves and everyone else. Basically what it amounts to. Uh, as you know, the treaty the Treaty for the Prevention of Nuclear Weapons Production went into force a couple of months ago. United Nations Treaty to block any development of nuclear weapons signed by 122 countries. Uh, none of the nuclear states, but the Biden administration could take steps towards inducing other going uh, its own making its own moves and inducing other nuclear states to move towards accepting the basic provisions of this new treaty that's in force that would mean accepting our obligation under the non-proliferation treaty to take good faith efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons all of that is perfectly possible with enough public pressure could happen. So just like establishing nuclear weapons free zones could, could happen. As I think we've probably discussed, it's not just the Middle East zone, that's the most important, but there are others. Now, what about the Africa zone? There is an Africa nuclear weapons free zone, but it can't be implemented because the British reject international law and international judgments they, and maintain their former colonial possession of Diego Garcia in violation of the famous rule of law, expelled most of the population to allow the United States to establish a military base there, which was upgraded to a nuclear military base in, under Obama. So that prevents the, the implementation of the African nuclear weapons free zone. 
And Diego Garcia is not symbolic. It's the base that's used for the bombing of uh, Central Asia and the Middle East. Actually, the same is true in the Pacific. There is a Pacific nuclear weapons free zone, but it's blocked by US insistence on maintaining nuclear facilities on its Pacific islands. Uh, of course. Which islands are those? Is it Guam? Which islands are those in the Pacific? Guam? Which islands in the Pacific? Oh. Guam? Guam is one, but the other Pacific islands, I've forgotten exactly which, also have facilities for nuclear, uh, nuclear submarines to come. So it's basically nuclear weapons facilities. I've forgotten exactly which, but there's a range of them. And of course, the United States, the, technically, the, technically, the United States is not supposed to have nuclear weapons in Japan. But there's been case after case where it's been exposed that nuclear weapons are in Japanese harbors, and other facilities. Kashmir is an unresolved issue of the 1947 British partition of the Indian subcontinent. The desires of the people of the Indian occupied area uh, were largely ignored. New Delhi never followed through on a plebiscite. In 1989, an uprising began and has continued on and off since. Thousands have been killed, many have disappeared, leading to the macabre term half widows. The Indian occupied area might be the most densely militarized zone on earth. Arundhati Roy has written extensively about Kashmir in her book, Azadi, Freedom, and in articles in The Guardian and uh, elsewhere. I just heard from uh, Sanjay Kak, who's a Kashmiri and a renowned documentary filmmaker and editor of an extraordinary book called Witness. He says this about Kashmir. In August 2019, the, August 2019, the Narendra Modi BJP-led Hindu nationalist government annulled Article 370 of India's constitution. That was the last vestige of the terms under which the former princely state of Jammu and Kashmir had acceded to India in 1947. It was a legally untenable step, rammed through parliament and came with an unprecedented clampdown by the military and paramilitary forces. And, of the longest internet shutdown by any democracy. It gave birth to the term internet apartheid. Despite the welcome coverage in the US media of what's happened in Kashmir recently and of the disastrous handling of the pandemic all across India, the Biden administration continues to turn a blind eye to the dismantling of India's democratic pretensions. In other words, the norm. It's a horror story. What Modi's done in Kashmir is out, totally outrageous. And in fact, for years before that, uh, Indian uh, behavior in Kashmir was criminal ever since the fraudulent elections of the late 80s. Uh, Kashmir's been one of the most militarized areas in the world, deeply oppressive uh, Indian actions escalated under, uh, under uh, Modi. Uh, and of course the US uh, keeps a, bl a blind eye, but on everything else too, Kashmir is occupied, Palestine's occupied, Western Sahara is occupied, uh, the occupation of Western Sahara was uh, authorized by Trump at the same time that he authorized the Israeli occupation of the Syrian Golan Heights and the occupied territories in, in uh, Jerusalem, Greater Jerusalem. Uh, 
the fame, the Abraham Accords, which were greatly applauded in the United States, are quite interesting. So the accords between the most reactionary states in the region, the Gulf dictatorships, where MBS has been given a mark of approval by the Biden administration for his criminal atrocities. The crown prince of Saudi Arabia. Yeah. What? The crown prince of Saudi Arabia, Saudi MBS. Arabia. Uh, the CC government, al CC government, the most brutal government in Egypt's history, the Gulf dictatorships are, of course, the most, maybe the most reactionary states in the world. Uh, Israel, which has moved very far to the right, uh, it provides the muscle. Uh, and they brought in Morocco. Morocco is a member of the Abraham Accords, which is interesting. It's, of course, another dictatorship. But why Morocco? Because one element of the, Mor of the Abraham Accords is to make take control of the major resources of the region. Well, in the Gulf dictatorships, the resource is oil, petroleum. What about Morocco? Morocco has a virtual monopoly over phosphates. These are irreplaceable. Uh, resources which are essential for agriculture. Western Sahara also has resources of phosphates, the main reason why Morocco wants to take it over. Uh, Trump authorized that as uh, another way to guarantee that the reactionary alliance controlled by Washington, which also includes Modi's India, that that alliance will also dominate the resources of the region. This is the main geostrategic program of the Trump administration adopted wholesale by Biden. Uh, afraid I'm gonna to have to take off at another interview one, coming. One more uh, question to wind up. Yeah. One more question to wind up. One more question, okay. Um, Archbishop Tutu, Nobel laureate, says, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. Talk about your commitment to justice and what you've done, what you've accomplished over the years in terms of your scholarship, but also in inspiring so many people. That's for other people to answer, not me. I've done what I can to other people to judge its validity and its efficacy. You know that uh, poem that uh, Howard Zinn closes the people's history of the United States with? It's by Shelley. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. <clears throat> Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ye are many, they are few. That's how Howard finished the people's history of the United States. We are many, they are few. That's always been true. You can take it back to my favorite philosopher, David Hume, wrote one of them first modern works in political science is First Principles of Government. He opens it in the first paragraph by saying, there's a strange mystery, namely the easiness by which the many are governed by the few, when in fact power is in the hands of the governed. So how come the allow themselves to be governed by the few who usually are acting against their interests. And he says, the only answer to this mystery is consent. The gover governors, the rulers manage to 
manufacture consent to use a more modern term. And as long as people consent and accept and subordinate themselves, the few will be able to rule the many, no matter how much they harm. And that's true. When the many recognize their own power and rise up, they can change things. Not Thanks easy. very much for your time.